Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very good morning to you. Uh, we will now resume the meeting, and I open this morning sessions on Internet as Engine for Growth and Sustainable Development. In this session, I'm looking forward to our discussion about three important issues. The first one is with regard to the World Summit for the Information Society. Uh, WSIS is uh, 10 years old now, in, in, the, on, in the 2015, and the UN General Assembly is deciding how to review WSIS follow-up to date, and then what the next 10 years of uh, WSIS follow-up will look like. Two thousand fifteen is also the ten years review of the UN's uh, Millennium Development Goals (MDGs) process. And given this confluence, uh, how will the next ten years of WSS connect to the next ten years of the MDGs? This session will explore how to answer these major questions two days after the UNGA discusses in three parts. With hopefully ample time for comments and questions from the audience in uh, each segment. Part two will highlight practical examples of how technology has been used to improve uh, access and uh, diversity. Now, uh, I would like to introduce our moderator for the first part of uh, our discussion, Mr. Yanis Karplin, the Assistant Director General for Communication and Information of UNESCO. Yanis, you have the floor. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, but uh, Marcus, before you, uh, if uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Samina Rashid is in the room, that would be good if you could identify yourself and come here. I uh, wanted to place you next to me. Yes, thank you. I'm Marcus Kilmer. I chair the preparatory process. Before we start, actually, a reminder, today is UN Day, so we're celebrating when the UN, UN got started. And just a few words on some of the underlying concept for those who are not too familiar with IGF and CSTD and whatever acronyms. When the mandate of the IGF was renewed, there was a working group set up under the Commission for Science and Technology for Development, and they made recommendations for IGF improvement. And one of the recommendations was that each session should address two or three policy questions. Now, we took that seriously and made a call, issued a call for a public input and received policy questions that they're available on the IGF website and we will also pull them up on the screen. It's not meant that you address all these questions but you take note of them and I know we have also developed your own questions. And uh, another thing, uh, the printed program was printed before we finalized uh, the program and we decided this week, the multi-stakeholder advisory group, to have tomorrow's session which is devoted to emerging issues to make it, it was originally a 90-minute session but now we have a slot for three hours and it will deal with surveillance, with government surveillance. So this is just an announcement that tomorrow the session, the main session, will deal with surveillance and back with that, back to you, Yanis. So thank you, thank you, Marcus, uh, and uh, I uh, would like to extend my uh, my greetings in the UN on the UN Day, on the occasion of UN Day, very appropriate uh, uh, day to discuss Millennium Development Goals, uh, WSIS goals, and how uh, what is the correlation and interplay uh, between them. Um, I. Um, Maybe uh, bef before uh, looking for Mr. Gordon uh, Manuain uh, and giving the giving, uh, floor to him, if he's in the room. Is he? I um, would like maybe to uh, give a lit little bit of a, a context and uh, background. As uh, Chairman uh, told, 
Uh, we are approaching 2015, uh, which uh, is the year when the international community will be reviewing uh, achievements in uh, implementation uh, decisions which were adopted in year 2000 at the Millennium Summit, and we'll be looking uh, how far uh, we have reached at uh, national level, at international level, in implementing uh, Millennium Development Goals. Uh, WSIS, which took place in 2003 and 2005, uh, also uh, adopted a set of goals, and I will remind about them uh, all of you. Uh, and uh, uh, during the uh, Tunis phase, one of the issues uh, under consideration was uh, how the um, implementation of WSIS decisions would feed uh, into uh, a review of uh, Millennium Development Goals and how technology could become a integral part of post-2015 sustainable development agenda. So this was uh, clearly identified that uh, WSIS process should should assist in uh, developing uh, in uh, reaching uh, Millennium Development Goals, and um, uh, technology should be seen as catalyst and engine of development. Um, in, in this session, we will uh, uh, try to explore uh, and better understand how these uh, two uh, processes are related and uh, how we will get uh, to, uh, uh, to the conclusions. But before go going and giving uh, floor to my uh, first uh, uh, speaker at this session, I would like to remind that Millennium Development Goals uh, consist of uh, eight uh, major goals, and they are uh, eradicating extreme poverty and hunger, achieving universal primary education, promoting gender equality and empowering women, reducing child, child mortality rates, improving maternity health, combating HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, ensuring environmental sustainability, and developing a global partnership uh, for development. Uh, Geneva uh, phase identified or set up uh, WSIS goals which uh, were supposed to be attend attained in 2015. And I will, again, will just list those goals to remind ourselves and to show how far um, we have gone in uh, or how far technological development has gone and um, you will see that some of those goals uh, maybe look a little bit naive because they represent our understanding in which direction technology is developing in uh, 2003. And WSIS 2015 goals are to connect villages with ICTs and establish community access points to connect universities, colleges, secondary schools, and pri primary schools uh, with ICTs, to connect scientific and research centers with ICTs, to connect public libraries, cultural centers, museums, post offices, and archives with ICTs, to connect health centers and hospitals with ICTs, to connect all local and central government departments and establish websites and email addresses, to adapt all primary and secondary school curricula to meet the challenges of the information society, taking into account national circumstances, to ensure that all of the world's population have access to television and radio services, to encourage the development of content and put in place te uh, technical conditions in order to facilitate the presence and use uh, of all world languages on the Internet, and to ensure that more than half of world's uh, inhabitants have access to ICTs within their reach. So these, these were goals uh, which uh, WSIS set uh, for um, uh, development uh, with the perspective of uh, 10 years. It is uh, very interesting to see how far we have uh, 
uh, got in uh, in technological evolution and uh, see uh, that some of them really are already outdated. Nevertheless, if we look uh, and an analyze whether these goals are uh, attained, we clearly can see that uh, many of them are, but certainly not all of them. And uh, in remaining years, we may uh, uh, wish to uh, put additional emphasis to those goals where attainment uh, falls slightly short. So I uh, do not see uh, Mr. Uh, Gordon Manuain. Is Mr. Gordon Manuain here in the room? Please. I was desperately waiting for you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Manuain is a special advisor uh, of the President of uh, Indonesia and special envoy on uh, Millennium Development Goals. He is in charge of overseeing regional and global affairs. And um, uh, he joined the uh, presidential office uh, in 2010 and uh, uh, Mr. Manuain uh, will be uh, sharing uh, with us uh, experience of uh, Indonesia in attaining uh, Millennium Development Goals. Mr. Manuain, the floor is yours. Can we please switch to the uh, screen computer? While we're uh, waiting and uh, uh, fixing some technical problems, I uh, uh, would like to announce that um, uh, the next uh, speaker after Mr. Manuain uh, will be uh, Mr. Felix Dodds, who will join us uh, remotely. And uh, Felix, if you uh, hear us, be, uh, please be prepared to join in uh, after the uh, presentation of Mr. Manuain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning to everybody. Um, it's uh, both a pleasure and honor for me to be here to attend this very important meeting of uh, IGF Forum. And uh, today I will share with you uh, our views about uh, the implementation of MDGs in Indonesia and uh, to see it, uh, its role in uh, generating uh, some progress uh, to achieve the MDGs in Indonesia. And we will uh, see uh, the special, we will focus, I will focus on a special emphasis on uh, partnership because it has been a driving force uh, for achieving MDGs in Indonesia. All right, okay. Uh, before we go into any depth, uh, uh, let's take a look at uh, the, uh, the status, current status of uh, Indonesia, yes, the current energy status in Indonesia. All right. Like many countries in the world, uh, Indonesia shows a mixed level of progress in MDG achievement. As you can see here, uh, our uh, MDG achievement can be categorized, categorized into three groups. First are the targets that are already achieved. Uh, here there are target related to MDG1, uh, that is uh, poverty alleviation, and there is also target uh, related to gender equalities, and also there is a target that has been achieved uh, in MDG6, and that concern a decrease in tuberculosis prevalence. Um, there are also a target in uh, column 12 that you can see here that these are the targets that are uh, on track to be achieved by 2015. But perhaps what is more important is that there are other targets that needs uh, hard work or extraordinary uh, 
achievement in order to meet this target by 2015. Uh, I'd like to uh, call your attention to these uh, three uh, issues. First is uh, high maternal mortality in Indonesia. Currently, the uh, rate stands at 228 uh, maternal mortalities per uh, 100,000 live births. And there's, uh, we have also huge problems with uh, the increased proportion of people with HIV and AIDS, which are still uh, make every effort to deal with this problem. And also, uh, we also have to work hard to deal with MDG7, and this is related to high level of greenhouse gas emission and safe drinking water and sanitation. Slide. And um, there are also, when we talk about MG achievement, uh, we have uh, some uh, huge challenge uh, to deal with uh, to make sure that we can achieve MG achievement by 2015. And we can see the, this challenge from the geographical perspective. As you may know, Indonesia is a uh, the largest archipelagic uh, country in the world. Uh, it has a considerable uh, span and barrier, so uh, you can imagine that it's hard to cover all from uh, Aceh to uh, Irian and from the uh, north of Indonesia to uh, Rota Island, which is situated in the southern area of Indonesia. And uh, we also have an uh, infrastructure problem that should be improved continually. And uh, the infrastructure problem uh, poses a significant challenge to uh, providing access to healthcare service, particularly a community health center for poor people in underserved remote areas in Indonesia. Slide. And also we can see uh, the challenge from population perspective. As you may know, Indonesia is a country with uh, the fourth largest population. Now uh, the figure stands at 250 million, and we also uh, see that the population growth uh, in Indonesia seem to outpace the progress of development. It means that uh, we will have to work very hard to keep pace with uh, the progress of development. And we have a success story of family planning in the past, but now we have. Uh, we are trying very hard uh, to be able to repeat its past successes. Also, from the population, uh, uh, from the perspective, we have also uh, uh, the effect that uh, the bulk of our population is at young population at productive age. This means that when these young people reach uh, uh, an elderly age, because our life expectancy rate is improving now, that means that uh, in the future we have to take care how to deal with uh, the growing portion of the aging population in Indonesia. This is one of the problems that we should deal with in the future. Slide. And uh, one of the typical uh, problems that in Indonesia is uh, related to children, women's and children's health in Indonesia. In Indonesia. There is a concern that uh, the achievement made in this area, particularly in reducing maternal mortality rate, is not enough because uh, uh, we uh, have to meet the target of uh, 102 maternal mortalities by, two, by 2015, but now we, our figure stands at 228 maternal mortalities, so we have to work hard to reach the target. And um, we need an uh, out-of-the-box approach and a synergy between government, uh, civil society, private sector, and academia, media, all to get all come together to make changes uh, to meet this target related to women's and children's health in Indonesia. Right. Uh, in fact, uh, the government in, in the government of Indonesia has uh, put. MDG achievement at the top of its agenda. And uh, there have been some milestones uh, since, uh, since the adoption of MDGs in 2000. Uh, chief among these are uh, national roadmap to accelerate the achievement of the MDGs in Indonesia. Uh, this roadmap uh, was uh, released in 2010 
and serve as a guideline for all the MDG stakeholders in Indonesia to uh, accelerate their program to meet the MDG target by 2015. And also, uh, one important, another important thing is that uh, there has been a mainstreaming of the MDGs into national long-term and mid-term uh, development plans. So uh, our nef- national uh, development plans uh, have been uh, uh, have been united has into uh, the MDGs. So there, there we all the priority of the MDGs are now in our development plans, and we have also and uh, we have also mainstream MDGs into national budget. And there uh, another important thing that uh, there has been a, a progress in uh, district and uh, provincial level in terms of uh, translating uh, some commitment into action by uh, uh, making their action plan to accelerate MDGs at the grassroots level. And uh, another important thing is that uh, we have been... Uh, organizing an annual Indonesia MDG Awards and this uh, form of uh, partnership between uh, government and civil society and private sector in accelerating the MDG achievement at grassroots level. Slide. And when we talk about uh, who uh, initiated the implementation of MDG program in Indonesia, uh, I should say that we have a two-pronged strategy here. So we uh, adopt a uh, what might be called a top-down and a bottom-up approach to accelerate MDG achievement in Indonesia. So uh, in this context, government is not uh, only uh, the, sole, uh, this, uh, this <coughs> the sole entity responsible for achieving MDGs, but now we have seen uh, a greater level of participation uh, by community. They have uh, taken responsibility to improve uh, their life through their own programs. Uh, this I call a community-driven programs that initiated by communities. Slide. And uh, let me give you one example of the how MDG program uh, put special em- emphasis on the partnership in Indonesia. So uh, for uh, over the last two years, we have been uh, developing and implementing a program. We call it uh, Penchera Nusantara. Uh, literally means uh, nation and nation's guiding light. This uh, an integrated healthcare uh, program, uh, healthcare program intervention uh, to provide access to healthcare service in underserved remote area in Indonesia. Uh, uh, what is the important thing about this program is that it integrates uh, a lot of aspects. So uh, it put a uh, uh, educations uh, at the core. Uh, also, there are uh, community empowerment in addition to health. So it's not uh, health uh, itself, but uh, we combine it with uh, education of the community and community empowerment. Uh, slide. And uh, we realize that uh, governments alone is. Uh, is not able to ensure the success of MDG. So what uh, we have been trying to do is to engage other sector in Indonesia to uh, come together to participate in a sustainable partnership to achieve in uh, MDGs in Indonesia. So uh, there is a strong focus on a partnership between a, a CSO, uh, pr- a private sector, academia, um, media and both national and local governments in our programs of Pencerano Center of Nation Guiding Light. Slide. Now uh, let me move uh, a bit to uh, what now uh, has been a, a hot issue that is uh, uh, post-2015 development agenda. There has been a lot of talk about uh, uh, post-2015 uh, development agenda and I think uh, it's time for us to uh, lay the groundwork for a uh, good uh, new development agenda. And we need to identify enabling conditions for this develop, new development agenda. Um, 
most of the talk about develop, uh, post-2015 development agendas revolve around uh, sustainable development. Here we can see that, uh, as you, you might know, there are three pillars of uh, economic development, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability. Uh, well, what we'd like to stress is that uh, we should uh, bring all these uh, different pillars properly together. So uh, we should not uh, emphasize one pillar over another, or we should not pursue uh, economic development to the exclusion of uh, environmental sustainability, but we see them in a, a well-balanced uh, manner. So, uh, And we believe that uh, this uh, sustainable development should be underpinned by peace, security, and good, govern good, governments, good governance to ensure that the success of these development goals. Slide. Now, uh, as uh, some of you may have uh, understood, a uh, high-level panel of eminent person on uh, post-2015 development agenda, uh, uh, in which uh, our president uh, is one of the chair in these uh, high-level panels, uh, they have uh, submitted a report uh, to the Secretary General of United Nations, and uh, they highlight uh, several important points, and one of that, those is that we need uh, the new development agenda need to be driven by five big transformative shifts. So there are five important points that are stressed uh, in the uh, report by the high level panel. Those are leave no one behind, put sustainable development at the core, transform economies for jobs and inclusive uh, growth, build peace and effective, open and accountable institution for all. And uh, most important of all is that this goal uh, should be achieved by forging a new global partnership. Slide. And uh, in that report uh, submitted by Halafel panel, uh, there is also uh, some emphasis on uh, partnership. Uh, they would like to see uh, an opportunity to expand uh, the traditional partnership so uh, in the post-2015 development agenda, we will uh, have a uh, more broad-based uh, new global partnership. So this partnership uh, should not only uh, involve government, but also uh, cut across uh, all social classes, uh, like people living in poverty, uh, people with disabilities, uh, women, civil society, indi indigenous and local communities, uh, marginalized groups, multilateral institutions, and many others. So, uh, uh, in essence, it's a time for the international community to use new ways of working. Uh, that is to go beyond, to go beyond an aid agenda. Slide. So, uh, uh, the high-level panel would like to explore uh, the possibility of uh, developing uh, uh, development assistance in the future. So, uh, they would like to broaden uh, the opportunity. Uh, to expand the, um, the traditional uh, modalities of uh, development assistance. For example, there is a possibility to include uh, private sector through uh, social investment and inclusive business. Uh, by such a partnership uh, between government and uh, private sector, it's expected that this will bolster significantly the achievement of the MDG target slide. And uh, when we, uh, our work focus on, as uh, I mentioned before, our work focus uh, much on a partnership and usually uh, these are the groups that we work with. There are youth groups or students and there are also private sector, uh, there are also government at both national and local level and civil society. Um, the unique thing about uh, this is that uh, each group usually brings in their own expertise. So usually uh, youth groups have uh, an expertise. It's mass campaign through social media and private sector usually have uh, ability in developing uh, uh, partnership, uh, replicate corporate values, and government usually uh, good at uh, creating enabling condition, enabling environment for uh, this MDG program and um, civil society usually uh, 
is world first in uh, building uh, community capacity and uh, doing evaluation, feedback, and reporting. Slide. Now, uh, again, um, uh, collective action has been a, an important key word in our achievement of the MDG target by 2015. We believe that without collective action, uh, much of our effort will uh, no will have no sustainable results. So we put a lot of uh, emphasis on collective action. We have worked with uh, civil society, with government at both national and local level, with private sector, and with the community at grassroots level. So uh, by now and after MDGs, there will be some unfinished agenda, MDG agenda, uh, and this should be pursued after 2015. So we feel that uh, by collective action we can uh, achieve, uh, we'll be in a better position to achieve MDG target. Now, uh, this concludes my overview of the implementation of MDG, MDGs in Indonesia and the progress we have made with some emphasis on the intersectoral partnership. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Mr. Manuel, for your uh, very, very rich uh, presentation. Congratulations with the achievements. Uh, you, you have, uh, Indonesia has gone really, really far. You clearly know what are the still areas where you need to put emphasis. And, um, and also, uh, as you mentioned, the Indonesian president is playing a very important role uh, in the um, uh, process which will lead to uh, definition of sustainable development goals. Uh, now I will turn to Mr. Felix, uh, Felix Dotz, who is uh, waiting uh, for uh, his presentation uh, from his uh, uh, hometown in uh, England. Felix Dotz is an author, futurist and activist, has been uh, involved in um, United Nations uh, works with a particular field in, on sustainable development and is uh, well known uh, for his uh, uh, book, How to Lobby the Intergovernmental Meetings. Uh, mine is Café Latte, which uh, he uh, wrote together with uh, Michael Strauss. Uh, Mr. Dodds, if you hear us, please, you have uh, your uh, seven to eight minutes. on what happened in the Rio plus 20 process, so uh, something to uh, consider buying as well. Uh, I'd like to start by complimenting uh, the government of Indonesia on their leadership in the Rio plus 20 process. Um, Mr. Chairman, the sound is very fuzzy. <laughs> co chairs the high-level panel. Um, and I think um, it shows a move of... Um, of leadership from more developed countries to leading development countries in a, a number of areas, but particularly in the run-up to Rio Plus 20, we saw Mexico as well as Indonesia and India and uh, Brazil and Colombia taking leadership, and I think that that's um, a very good sign. I wanted to cover in my um, presentation four areas, a little bit of the history of the MDGs, implementation of some of the issues, uh, the development of the Sustainable Development Goals, which was uh, mentioned just in the run-up to Rio, and I'll return to that in the final session in a little bit more depth. Um, and some lessons which um, uh, the WSIS process might uh, consider. So I remember well the preparation for the Millennium Summit in 2000, because it was happening just as the World Summit on Sustainable Development was starting to gain traction. Like many environment and sustainable development NGOs, Stakeholder Forum, who I was then the director of, made a strategic decision that the Millennium Summit seemed to be going nowhere. We therefore decided to put our efforts into securing what we hoped would be a new deal between developed and developing countries to deliver Agenda 21. And we hope this would be done at the World Summit on Sustainable Development in September 2002. Of course, the election in the United States in 2000 and 
was considerable and was considerably going to derail the uh, process around the World Summit. So how wrong we were, and we were, many of us, wrong, I think, in uh, what the Millennium Summit was going to achieve. In the last three months before the summit, the UN Secretary General, OECD, and the World Bank came forward with what became the Millennium Development Goals. And you have to remember that these were drawn from the OECD Development Assistance Committee, the DAC targets, which were part of their original 1996 strategic paper, Shaping the 21st Century. And as was mentioned, I think, by, um, by our uh, moderator, he, uh, there were eight goals and um, for the sustainable development community, um, NDG 7 was very important, ensuring environmental sustainability. But it was actually a very weak goal, partly because the environmental sustainable world didn't go to the Millennium Summit in September 2000. Uh, it was clearly a top-down approach target setting, and that brought the wrath of many of the NGOs at the time. The entire NDGA process has been accused of lacking legitimacy as it failed to include the voices of the very participants that the NDGs seek to assist. And since then, of course, uh, most of those people have become supporters and have helped to try and see those targets achieved. And that's why in the process for the SDGs, there's much more of a bottom-up approach, and I think that's very good. But not all the targets were agreed in 2000. For example, a sanitation target was added under NDG7 after the World Summit on Sustainable Development, and the Global Partnership NDG was uh, amended after the 2005 World Summit. I think on the implementation, it's really interesting, because the 1990s saw significant commitments made by governments at the Rio Earth Summit, the Copenhagen Social Summit, the Women's uh, Beijing Conference, the Cairo Population Conference, the Istanbul Human Settlements Conference, and the Rome Food Summit. Uh, but by 2000, it was clear that governments seemed to be unable to implement across such a wide area and were having significant problems in prioritizing resources to the most important areas. So the MDGs were an attempt to simplify this. Eight goals with only 21 targets. So the criticism of the targets was that they were not ambitious enough. Uh, target 7D, for example, aims to, by 2020, to have achieved a significant improvement in the lives of at least 100 million slum dwellers. For context, India alone is estimated to have close to 100 million slum dwellers. So, the ambition in certain cases wasn't um, as high as it needed to be. One of the significant results of the summit in 2000 was that overseas development assistance had started to go up again after a period of 10 years from 1992 to 2000 where we saw no real increase in ODA. Uh, the next 10 years saw ODA double from around 60 billion to 120 billion a year. And this went a long way to accelerate implementation, a challenge that was underlined in 2008 at the UN Special Session on MDGs, when the UN Secretary General said this about the development agenda. Looking ahead to 2015 and beyond, he said, there is no question that we can achieve the overarching goal. We can put an end to poverty. But he also recognized the challenge of the financial crisis to reaching those goals. But he went on to say, we face a global economic slowdown and food security crisis, both of uncertain magnitude and duration. Global warming has become more apparent. These developments will directly affect our effort to reduce poverty. The economic slowdown will diminish the incomes of the poor. The food crisis will raise the number of hungry people in the world and push millions more into poverty. And climate change will have a disproportionate impact on the poor. The need to address these concerns, pressing as they are, must not be allowed to detract from our long-term effort to achieve the MDGs. On the contrary, our strategy must be to keep the focus on the MDGs as we confront these new challenges. 
those were very, very important words and reflected in a sense why some of the MDGs um, are now not being uh, delivered. Because the reality is now that we will reach only a few of those MDG targets and as many developed countries have started to drop their odour contribution. And though odour isn't everything, it does for many of the least developed countries play a very significant role. Netherlands became the first country to drop back under 0.7% uh, GNP target uh, this year. On the positive side, the UK reached the target with the political support of all parties. And to some extent, that was the consequence of what I call the Band-Aid generation. Those UK citizens and now politicians in, in uh, power who in the 1980s raised millions of dollars for Ethiopia and other famines under the leadership of the pop star Bob Geldof. It started with a single, Do They Know It's Christmas, possibly the most influential pop song for uh, development aid. A few of the key reasons we're seeing some of these goals more is that the process has had uh, yearly global reports on the progress to deliver the MDGs. We've seen an annual review of individual goals for the UN annual ministerial review and biannual development forum. We've seen government aid uh, departments focusing on the goal, but of course by them doing that, they have uh, taken money away from other areas which have suffered in the last one year. And we've seen national implementation strategies as the government of Indonesia was indicating uh, in their presentation, often linked to support from the UN and the World Bank and so their coherence at the national level has played, I think, a, a significant role. And as Indonesia also indicated, in many countries, that's been through the support of stakeholders, whether it's the private sector, NGOs, or community-based organizations. Um, I'm looking at my third area, which is the development of the Sustainable Development Goals in the run-up to Rio. And the idea of the Sustainable Development Goals was articulated in July 2011 at a Rio plus 20 government-sponsored event on institutional framework for sustainable development held in Soro, Indonesia, uh, by uh, the presented by Paolo uh, Caballero, who was the, is the director of um, economic and social and environmental affairs in the Colombian government, supported by Guatemala and other governments shortly afterwards, such as Peru and UAE, and that push for sustainable development goals coming from developing countries, again showed that transfer of leadership from uh, developed countries to developing countries. The original proposal for the SDG was grounded on the idea that the MDG had played a significant role in focusing the world community, but that, that focus was too narrow, and that seven of the eight goals were targeted to the only developing countries. The only universal goal in the eight focused on the environment, MDG 7 was, as I mentioned, seemed to be very weak by many of the um, people in the environment and sustainable development community. The original proposal for the SDG advocated a reinvigoration of the spirit of um, MDG 7 by updating the sectoral chapters of Agenda 21, the Johannesburg Plan of Implementation, with up-to-date sectoral targets. And although the original proposal significantly evolved over the months up to Rio plus 20, the solo chair's text already reflected the value of the new idea. It said that there is a significant interest in the discussion of sustainable development goals. The chair's text also reflected the likely difficulty in negotiating new goals during the Rio plus 20 process. In September 2011, NGOs and other stakeholders met in Bonn at the UN DPI 64th NGO conference. And they put on the table the, for the first time a set of coherent goals, 17 of them. It's well worth looking back to that particular document that came out of that conference to see the influence that it had in the thinking of governments as far as uh, what uh, SDGs should be considered. In the run-up to Rio Plus 20, there was much conflict between the environment and development community. The development community wanted to continue the MDG approach, and the sustainable development community wanted these new goals to be encompassing both poverty eradication and 
sustainable development, and that any new goals needed to be universal and would also address issues such as consumption and production to enable all of us to live, on, uh, live in a more sustainable way on this planet. I will continue this story in the final session on how the SDGs have developed, but I wanted to end by saying that one of the most significant outcomes of Rio Plus 20 was the agreement that there would be a set of sustainable development goals. The question, of course, was left open, what would be the relationship with the NPD? What, but what Rio Plus 20 did do was to start a rebirth of sustainable development as the main conceptual framework for development in the 21st century, and by doing so, offer a real chance that we might be able to address these challenges together. So to finalize, there's some uh, issues where I think the WSIS process might learn something from. One, that money follows goals. So this was clear from the MDG. So if you don't have any targets or indicators that are embedded in these new goals, then money will be less uh, for the area that you're interested in. But engagement with the preparatory process will be critical for your agenda. You need to be engaged now, and you need to be engaged in a very full and front way. But any national follow-up mechanisms uh, that are set up, and we, again we heard from Indonesia how effective theirs was, uh, any follow-on process, you need to integrate the WSIF into that one process, because there is only room for one process. The collaboration with other sectors will help deliver your agenda, working in silos does not. Perhaps if I could end with a few words from Albert Einstein, who said, learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow, but the important thing is not to stop questioning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Felix. It's uh, a very, very uh, good presentation and, and put us... Uh, really uh, gave us very good perspective. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I know that we are uh, running uh, very late and uh, I think uh, since we had very, uh, two very rich presentations, uh, I don't believe that there will be any uh, specific questions about MDGs and, and relationship between WSAS and, and MDGs. I just want to um, uh, 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 finalize uh, my part of the uh, presentation or, or, or session uh, maybe by putting uh, on the uh, screen one uh, picture just indica uh, which indi indicates the complexity of process which leads uh, towards uh, the uh, adoption of uh, sustainable development goals and I uh, see if, if we can, if we can uh, switch to the main computer. Um, yeah. Seems it doesn't work, does it? Can the technicians please switch to the front computer? Yeah, you see, you see now uh, on the screen uh, how many work streams uh, will. Uh, are organized uh, which uh, should converge to one uh, document which will be then endorsed by international community in uh, uh, as, as a sustainable development goal framework uh, after 2015. Uh, what we see uh, today very clearly that uh, until now technology uh, is not very much present in any of uh, available documents uh, of this process. And that is uh, really pity. And during the next session, which will be uh, moderated, uh, moderated by um, Robert Pepper, Vice President of, uh, from Cisco, uh, we will demonstrate uh, that technology indeed can be catalyst and can be uh, in some in uh, some cases a uh, motor of development and hopefully that this uh, will encourage those uh, who have a, uh, who who has a power to uh, bring that to attention uh, of um, um, millennium or sustainable development agenda preparatory process 
Robert, I am giving a microphone to you now. Thank you, Janus. Um, we are a little bit behind on time, but we are going to catch up, and I want to make sure that we have time for discussion as well as from the remote moderators. Um, I will dispense with um, uh, long biographies um, and just sort of tell people who are speaking. I'm, this is a, actually, for me, um, uh, the, the very exciting part of the, of the session. Uh, those of you who know me um, know that I'm very pragmatic, so I always try to go to what are some real examples. We've had a great conversation so far on the framework, what's possible, how to think about it, but we have three short presentations that demonstrate concrete experiences on how the Internet and how what we're doing here at the Internet Governance Forum has had a direct impact on development. First, uh, Martin Botterman, who is chairman of the board for PRI, the Public Interest Registry, um, is going to show us a video. Um, Farid Marouf, who is the uh, country director in Indonesia for the Grameen Foundation, uh, is going to, uh, again, I think, do you also have a, a, a video? Um, no, you're just going to talk about what you're doing. And then uh, Jorge uh, Abinda Maria is going to, uh, who's from uh, Uruguay, is going to talk about some examples that he's been working with. So let's get right into it. Uh, Martin, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, let's see the video. Yes, thank you, Robert. Um, let's see the video of the very short connecting remarks after that. If we could roll the video and put it on, there we go. Vor sechs Jahren habe ich mit meiner Familie eine Weltreise gemacht. Wir waren unter anderem in Bhutan und in Äthiopien und haben ein paar ganz tolle Projekte gesehen, die uns vollkommen begeistert haben, wie die Menschen vor Ort ihre Welt verbessern. Und wir haben gedacht, niemand in Deutschland kennt diese Projekte. Als ich von der Weltreise zurückkam, hatte ich die Vision, dass man eine Plattform bauen könnte, wo genau solche Grassroots-Projekte sich einer weltweiten Öffentlichkeit vorstellen könnten und Unterstützung finden können. Und so entstand die Vision von betterplace.org. Hi, ich bin Moritz, einer der Mitgründer von Better Place. Und hier seht ihr, wie aus unserer Vision Wirklichkeit wurde. Mehr als 35 Leute arbeiten an der besseren Welt und Better Place wächst und gedeiht weiter. Better Place ist eine Crowdfunding-Plattform für soziale Projekte. Wir bringen Spender und soziale Initiativen auf sehr transparente Art und Weise zusammen. Mittlerweile konnten schon über 350.000 Spender 5.000 Projekte unterstützen. Und für die spendensammelnden Organisationen ist das einfach sehr effizient, das Internet. Und äh, andererseits auch für die Spender eine gesunkene Einstiegshürde, ähm, weil sie viel einfacher ihr Lieblingsprojekt finden, ihr neues. Man kann jetzt sogar Projekte in seiner ganz nächsten Umgebung finden. Einfach äh, auf seinem Smartphone gucken und dort werden Projekte, äh, sei es Geld- oder Zeitspendenprojekte angezeigt, die in der Nachbarschaft sind. Ein Projekt, das ich sehr toll finde und das schon sehr viel Geld über uns gesammelt hat, ist ein Projekt, wo äh, obdachlosen Müttern und ihren Kindern geholfen wird. Und es liegt in München und heißt, unterstützen Sie obdachlose Kinder und Mütter. Und da geht es um äh, die Finanzierung von äh, ganz konkreten äh, Dingen wie Nahrungsmittel, Babynahrung und äh, schon 500 Spender haben dieses Projekt unterstützt. Die Wahl der Endung.org war für uns nicht nur einfach eine Internetadresse, sondern wir haben sie zum zentralen Markenkern gemacht, indem wir von betterplace.org reden. Die .org-Endung ist eigentlich eine große Community von Organisationen und Institutionen, die sich bemühen, 
sozialen Fortschritt zu bewegen und die Welt zu einem besseren Ort zu machen. Und wir arbeiten international ähm, und deswegen kam nie in Frage, die DE-Endung zu nehmen, sondern äh, es war klar, dass wir die Org-Endung nehmen, weil die natürlich auch international bekannt ist. Und das Internet verändert äh, die Welt, verändert alle Branchen und äh, das ist so ein klasse Medium, dass äh, auch der soziale Sektor davon profitieren muss und genau das machen wir mit betterplace.org. Wir verändern die Welt durch das Internet. I think this was the video in essence. Yeah, so Martin, the, um, uh, because so we can stop the video now. Uh, uh, because there was not a German to English translation, they couldn't do the subscribing. Those who could see the screen could see the subtitles in English, but the people in the back might not have been able to see it up there. So you might want to give a short, very... Oh, that was, it, was, it was great for those who actually could... Uh, yeah. understand German or read the well, English subtitles. Oh, well, I, I very much appreciate the initial introductions about the Millennium Development Goals, which are larger than life and really about people in this world. Uh, and the, the intent with this video was very much to share uh, real action out there, real people doing things, things that were never possible before and are really truly enabled uh, by the Internet or made much more effective by the Internet. Uh, so it is used by the development community and uh, uh, it's really uh, a call for, uh, of course, the development community to go on by using the current uh, possibilities even better uh, with all the limitations that are there. And, and uh, the IGF is one of the places that contribute to that understanding. Um, uh, next to that, uh, it's the industry also creating uh, a more supportive Internet every day. And the support is in two ways. One is, of course, uh, which has been clearly the subject uh, uh, at the IGF as well. It's more access. It's connection, uh, connecting uh, people, connecting institutions. Uh, at the same time, it's also about adding value. And whereas I can see that the emphasis is often from the, uh, the I would almost say, the, 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 the northern part, to be more on, ad, on the use and the adding value. Uh, in the South, the emphasis is on getting connected. Uh, you can't do one without the other. It's, we can do both, and uh, we do. Uh, in this world, which is uh, increasingly globalizing, uh, the role of NGOs improve, uh, contribute more and more, and are an essential element. And uh, one of the things we, for instance, are working on right now is to get a brand dot NGO in the world, which is only for NGOs, and, and this will help them to get even better access to donors, to people uh, that they step up to, and uh, in that way, uh, the established big NGOs like Red Cross won't use that, won't need that, but it's the small and the medium-sized uh, NGOs uh, in the world that will be able to benefit in this way even better from the Internet. So this is a little bit of what the industry can do to help, and it's uh, really about empowering the world to step up to uh, not lean back and wait for governments, but uh, all act together in uh, reaching out to those goals we all care about. Sorry, uh, just a quick message to the scribes. You had the wrong speaker. That was Martin Botzemann from the PIR registry, and not uh, Jorge Albin de Maria. So Please then correct it in the finalized transcript. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Um, Martin, one, one of the things that you pointed out is that it's focusing on applications and content, that what we would think of as the demand side in addition to the supply side. It's not just about the connection. That's only the necessary but not sufficient first step. It's actually how we use it. Right, and, and that, I think, is extremely important um, as part of the conversation of how do we think about the Internet and Internet governance to support development, right? Um, sometimes we tend to focus just on the Internet piece, right? it, which is nice, it's great, that's what we do, but the real benefits are how people use it. Yes, and uh, I think uh, in this, it's okay that uh, if you're not connected, obviously you're focused on getting connected, but at the same time it's not a big investment to look at what the rest of the world 
is what's, what's happening out there and benefit from all the extra added value that is uh, increasing every day in different areas and, and make sure you take that on board. Thank you. Now we are moving to Farid Marouf. So the scribe can attribute the next bit to Farid. Farid. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, I'm representing an organization, uh, Grameen Foundation, which is the mission is uh, poverty eradication. Uh, within our organization, we have several solution areas. I'm going to discuss a little bit, example, what we do in the other part of the world, in Indonesia, on these three um, solution area. The first solution area that we uh, work on is the information services. In information services, uh, a good example that we have is we create a platform for uh, health, maternal health in Ghana uh, to help to reduce that, you know, the first presentation mentioned about child death, uh, mothers. So we have an application platform that help the mothers to have better information how to take care of their pregnancy and when they have delivered the baby they also have the knowledge how to take care of their kids and we have application also to mo help them to monitor uh, by inputting the data and regularly sending messages to the mothers but like now is seven months old your baby should be able to do this this way it's supposed to like this and like that so we have that in Ghana uh, very successful the project called MOTACH M-O-T-A-C-H uh, then we replicate that in India with more a team on HIV AIDS. Uh, the other part of information services is uh, agriculture information services. We create a ecosystem community knowledge worker, which is actually extension worker. We power them with technology, mobile technology in Uganda, and we're trying to create a private sector sustainability to ensure that this is, will be beyond the donor money. Um, many of extension workers fall into the government um, domain in many countries, but we're trying to extend that and create incentive for the privatizing, privatizing the extension worker. Uh, example of this application is to uh, provide the farmer with good farming practice, uh, certification, traceability, tra certification traceability. If they do, they will receive more money for their product. In Indonesia, we're trying to replicate that because we also see a lot of ch challenge in the uh, smallholder farmers in Indonesia. A good example, cocoa industry, our productivity is half of the other countries. Uh, uh, per, per hectare, Indonesia could produce around 800, while the South America could produce 2,000 kilograms. So there's a room for improvement. Rather than just giving them information about market price, we also try to improve their uh, yield. Uh, the other part of that uh, solution area is the what we call poverty tools and insight. This is what we're also using internet, where we create a tools, uh, a scorecard, now available in 46 countries, to easy for any organization that would like to work in poverty eradication uh, to evaluate and to profile and to target their uh, constituents. Uh, this is, these poverty is derived from national census for each country. Usually it came from 200 questions, then we do some correlation, correlation and then we come up with 10 most simple questions for us to, uh, to see how poor somebody is. The question is simply simple to to ask and uh, to validate. The question never asks about the income, but it will ask you con condition of living. For example, in Indonesia, we ask whether what kind of a toilet they have, uh, what kind of a gas, whether they're using three kilogram uh, uh, gas for a cooking or 20 kilogram cooking. From there, you will get score one to two, one to 100. Then, uh, based on the score, uh, you can also create what we we call poverty outreach reports and also we can use the monitoring over the time. Uh, currently, um, in Indonesia, I think it's already been used for almost two million uh, audience. Uh, some of the big institutions uh, you know, intensively using this to, to part of their uh, operation. Uh, the last one is financial services. 
where we trying to find pot- potential uh, product using mobile technology that could help the poor, especially to reach out the base of pyramid, uh, the unbanked, uh, by helping them to define a product based on customer need rather than when we design them from, from the lab or from the desk. So we go to the last mile asking them what kind of product. Uh, currently we work uh, uh, one of product, uh, one of project that we have uh, in Uganda, for example, uh, trying to find a simple product um, like goal-based saving where someone could have a, uh, a goal, like want to send the kids to the school, and then they contact, contact their friends, their, their family, and everybody will chip into SMS uh, mobile money to save the money to that goal. The other uh, product uh, that I like to tell is the call Me to Me, where we, where somebody could sell their money to themselves over on certain time. So like saving, but because this person doesn't have a bank account, it's just a good way for, for, for them to, to hide this money from somebody, including their husband, for example. Um, yeah, I think that's enough for me. Thank you, Farid. Um, Jorge, um, the floor is yours. And then we will have time for questions from the floor as well as remote. Go ahead. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> A member of the board of the agency for the e-government and information society development of my country, Uruguay. Uh, since founding is six years uh, ago, we have worked based in, in digital aging. Uh, actually, we are in the third version, and it has uh, 15 goals and 79 uh, measurable t- targets. My presentation today is a report on some progress made, and in, in particular to Plan Seibal, Plansibal is the plan for one uh, laptop per child. I would like to remark that uh, Plansibal began six years ago, and six years is the length of the primary school cycle. So at the end of this year, the first child who received a laptop is going to end this uh, primary school seeking, so we are evaluating and strengthening all that. Please, uh, I have a video if the technical people could put it in, in the screen. Ah, okay. Yes. Uruguay? Muchos piensan primero en el fútbol, la celeste. Otros nos identifican por nuestras costumbres. Y por tener cuatro veces más ganado que gente. Con un sistema educativo gratuito, laico y obligatorio desde 1877. Hoy como derecho, cada uno de los niños tiene su computadora personal del Plan Seibal. Que se utilizan en el aula, permiten la enseñanza de programación y robótica, además de ser una herramienta de evaluación educativa en línea. Uno de cada cinco uruguayos es beneficiario del Plan Saibal. Con el 95% de los centros educativos conectados a Internet y un 65% de los hogares con PC. También hemos logrado disminuir la brecha digital entre los hogares de mayores y menores ingresos a solo el 6%. Tener conectividad de calidad ya no es un lujo de pocos, es un derecho de todos. Tenemos la primera red LTE de Latinoamérica. En Uruguay tenemos datos abiertos de gobierno. Combinamos y transformamos los datos y así construimos información y servicios para todos. La tecnología nos está ayudando a innovar en la relación entre la ciudadanía y la administración pública. La tecnología 
También está presente en los espacios más tradicionales como el campo, con una trazabilidad vacuna individual al 100%. Y en los más innovadores, como la pujante industria nacional del software, cada vez más atractiva para el exterior. Compromiso País. Esto es Uruguay Digital. The video uh, continues. Oh, sir, uh, the video continues then, please. To, uh, can we continue the video? Yeah, thank you. There was more. So, quick play. computadora. La maestra me llamó y me dio una compu con mi nombre y nos dio más y más computadoras. Hasta que todos los niños de todas las escuelas tuvimos nuestras propias computadoras. Un montón de señores se pusieron a trabajar para que si mis amigos tengamos internet en la escuela. Y todos tuvimos que aprender cosas nuevas. ¡Hasta los maestros! Los liceos también tienen computadoras. país que los niños tienen acceso de todas las clases sociales a esta herramienta bueno ahora con el plan Seibal y la información y el acceso a aprender se niveló o sea tenemos igualdad de oportunidades para avanzar mire para allá cuánto eh, tendrás que darle bueno sí, Manuel, 120. No, le 120 ah, mire. perfecto de que me pregunten dónde vivo. Bueno, vivo en Uruguay, en el país donde todos los niños de las escuelas públicas tienen una computadora. Thank you, we can Se la llevan a la casa uh, de ellos. Que van a salir de la escuela y va a seguir siendo de ellos. ¿Qué más podemos pedir? Could we stop the video, please? Video nya bisa diberhentikan. Thank you, thank you, Jorge. This um, a lot of questions, yes. which but this is this is great. It's very concrete. Um, how you've used the internet in a plan going back now six years, deploying it, putting it in schools, and you're now about to evaluate, which is always the, t the tough question, which is, okay, we had this great idea. Does it work? What did we learn? How can we improve? So I'd love to hear about that very, very briefly, because I definitely want, we need to leave some time to open up for the questions, but thank you. Go ahead. I would like to remark that the um, best tool to teach are the teachers. Yes. Okay. And um, 
we have introduced a new a, a new tool, it's, uh, the, the laptop. But the laptop is uh, not only uh, uh, not a, a tool for learning. It's a tool for improve the um, capacities of the of the, uh, the child child. Yes. This, um, they now are uh, taking the capability to access the internet, give their computer to the family, and um, yes. use it to learn English, to learn uh, math. We have uh, um, agreement with the uh, school, uh, British school in England, they, they uh, import um, by e-learning English to the children in Uruguay. So uh, it's important to, to see that we are not working with a tool only for traditional education. Hmm? No, this, and this is, this, this is exactly the point. So yeah. maybe look, if we can come back to that, um, I first want to see whether there are any questions on the th three presentations that were great, again, very concrete, um, very practical, and we actually have seen some real-world examples of how the technology and the Internet is being used. Jorge's last point, I think, is extremely important. It's really about people, and the technology is not standalone. It's how do we use the technology and integrate it into the people processes, right? Yes. We sometimes forget that, but this is extremely, extremely important. Um, let me open it up. Uh, it's here. And is there anybody in the back? Because we have some roving microphones as well. Yep. Okay. If you could introduce yourself. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Bob. Thank you. My name is Santosa. I am from the Indonesian ICT Society, Master. So I fully agree and endorse what the moderator mentioned. Even in the scheme of the United Nations for the MDG, the technology was ignored. So it, it seemed to me that take it for granted that's already available. Like in the pillar, three pillars that mentioned by Bapak Gordon, Mr. Gordon from Indonesia, the first pillar, you can look at that, there is a infrastructure. But in the government understanding, infrastructure is not included the ICT. Infrastructure is hard infrastructure like the road, let's say harbor, airport, and so on. The government consider that ICT already available, built by private sector. So therefore, they don't have to think about that. So my organization always convinced, look, we need the broadband to the village. I fully agree that teacher is very important. But if the infrastructure is not available there, I think it will be harm and danger if we teach, let's say, with the very slow speed of the Internet facility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other? Oh, we'll go Jane and then here. Okay. Jane. Thank you very much. Um, Jane Coffin from the Internet Society. I would also amplify the comment from our last speaker and suggest that rather than just in one of those three pillars, that ICTs are something that must horizontally cross all of those layers. Um, I'll give you an example of a situation related to the earthquake in Haiti where one aid development organization had not even factored in ICT when they were going in to do disaster management relief. I was on a team working with them, and people were talking about what needed to be done, and we thought, well, of course you know that communications and ICT is one of the most critical things related to going in, and it shouldn't be an afterthought, but it was. So the interesting thing for all of us, and we work very closely with bringing ICT around the world at the Internet Society, is that perhaps we should rethink where that ICT layer is. Is it horizontally across, or do you just put it in specific pillars? I think we may want to rethink how that's done. 
Thank you. Um, that actually raises uh, an important point, which is some of the work that's been done recently at the World Bank uh, that has looked at general purpose technologies, the combustion engine, electricity, basic telephony. These are general purpose technologies on which other things are built, computing. Uh, their conclusion is that broadband is one of those general purpose technologies and therefore like a, the combustion engine and electricity needs to be thought of as horizontally enabling technology. So I would endorse what you're saying uh, and there's some empirical evidence to support that as well and that we don't think about it enough in that in that sense. Um, the uh, we had another comment in the city next to, yeah, down here, sitting next to Desiree. Thank you. Introduce yourself, please. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Eddie Toy. I am from ICT Society of Indonesia. Uh, I came from the same organization with uh, Dr. Stianto. He is my chairman. Uh, probably what I would like uh, to, um, to tell this in this forum, uh, not, not too much far from what uh, Dr. Stianto has said. You know, when we are talking about the Internet, we... Um, will be automatically um, related it into the, uh, the quality of the network by uh, IC by itself. You know, uh, I would like to share with you all here that in Indonesia, in, since 1993-1994, uh, all the network uh, infrastructures built by the private sectors in which the government is uh, spending not too much for this, um, instead of, uh, you know, um, they, they, they uh, do the taxing, the taxation and, and you know, regular charges also in the uh, very significant uh, numbers in which this is a, a, a big burden for the operators. I think when we are concerned that the Internet will be, uh, will play an important role on how to maintain the growth and sustainability of the de development, I think the IGF will also has the obligation on how to convince all the respective governments on how to spending in a significant numbers of um, money for the infrastructures rather than uh, leave it uh, uh, the, to the all of, uh, all of operators. This is what happened in Indonesia. I think this is very important. So um, that's why, in, you know, in the, um, the new plan for the uh, law uh, of telecommunication in Indonesia, we from Mastel uh, would like um, to draw the attention from the government that they will have to uh, to um, to spend um, significant numbers of money uh, in the network. Thank you. So, um, we did a study with the UN Broadband Commission uh, that was published in July, and it examined national broadband plans uh, and whether or not having a plan, whether it was called a plan or a strategy or something else, whether having one made a difference. And the short answer is, empirically, we found, yes, it does make a difference. And it's not just correlational, because it was time series data, 10 years, 160 plus countries. Um, there's a, a causality. One of the findings, uh, conclusions, is that, that we had, and this is with the Broadband Commission, that we did this research collaboratively with them, um, is that public-private partnerships are much more effective than the private sector going alone or government going alone. Uh, and what we found was that if it's the private sector going alone, because uh, frankly the private sector does most of the investment, is on top of the most advanced cutting-edge technology, is more flexible and, the, and uh, can, can adapt more rapidly than governments which tend to move more slowly by design, which is a good thing. Um, but because of that, the private sector has to lead in the implementation. But what we found was that if you left it just to the private sector, there would be gaps that would not be filled. And therefore, the role of government is to set out the vision, the goals, orchestrate, coordinate, and fill gaps. And the gaps are particularly um, focused on rural underserved areas and low income areas and low income people. Um, so it's really a, a blend. It's not either or. It's the public-private partnership that we found that was 
the most effective approach. And I think this is essentially what, what, what you are saying. There's a separate question is how much does government actually have to spend to, pe- to fill those gaps? And there are a lot of techniques that government can use to get more private sector investment. Some of the spending or techniques they can use are indirect with tax credits, so it's not having to necessarily write a check, right? But it is an expenditure or an investment by government. So I think the point that you made, um, you know, is, is, is extremely important. Yes, uh, thank you. But actually I'd like uh, to add a little bit more. That, you know, um, when you said that um, the government will have to fill the gap um, um, therein, uh, there is a, like uh, for the rural areas. You know, in Indonesia, um, for the rural areas, um, for, and for the ec- and economic uh, viable uh, areas, that's only b- built by the uh, private sectors through the scheme of uh, what we call USO, Universal Service Obligations. Uh, for the uh, government, um, for the operators, they have to, um, to pay 1.25% uh, from the, the um, gross revenues, uh, from the gross um, revenues of the, the operation yearly. There's a big, big, uh, big amount of um, you know, funding, actually, uh, in which when um, this um, uh, used to fund uh, coming back to, um, to the sectors, to the um, to industry, maybe uh, it will be help as well. But currently, uh, what, what they get from, from the use of, the use of fund uh, is um, not all, not even uh, 25% coming back to the sectors. That is also a um, problem with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Jorge, and by the way, you can speak in Spanish. We do have translation. I think we have translation in Spanish into English, and so okay. this will be easier for you. We should have said this at the beginning. Yeah, gracias. Thank, gracias. You. Uh, Thank you. In my, país, la... in my country communications belongs to the responsibility of the state. And this has allowed us to uh, use the benefits to provide all the services through the entirety of our country, of course, with the existing communications infrastructure, I'm talking about telecom, internet, etc. So this means that the government has a considerable responsibility to cover those areas, those regions, where there is not the the ability to obtain those communication facilities yourself. And this is part of the responsibility of the government. Not all of the investment that has been made require huge amounts you can give, for example, $100 per child per year, and that will give considerable benefits to the child. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at the microphone, uh, uh, first Patrick yeah. will go to the microphone, then come back to Patrick, please. Uh, hi, my name is Ramanan from India. I work for the Tata Group. We launched an initiative in India for, called Empowering Emerging India really essentially looking at how to leverage technology and the internet for more creative economy and uh, sustainable development in India in the emerging cities. Uh, one of the, uh, the purpose here was really to integrate and bring together a multi-stake uh, dialogue between academics in uh, emerging city, uh, local government and local industry. And how do we ensure that together we create the opportunities for uh, better employment and, and increasing the economy of that local uh, place. Um, and uh, the challenge that we found really was uh, in India in particular, as if you go to the more rural places, uh, the challenge is that of skills development. Um, you have to have very good skills development initiatives. Uh, we're talking about more than a billion people with more than 250 million absolutely uh, having no um, background on education or training and so on. So I'd like to know uh, what are the ways IGF uh, facilitates uh, dialogue in this uh, direction and any particular incentives that the Indonesian government, for example, in their program were able to, um, they could share some of the best practices uh, which enables skills development at a completely different level as compared to where we are today. Thank you. 
Why don't we go to two other interventions and then maybe come back to see whether there's a response uh, specifically from Indonesia. We'll do Patrick and then over here. Thank you, Pepper. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about this uh, interesting discussion around, you know, how to promote infrastructure in, in in different countries. And this is one of the most fascinating, I think, public policy debates that we're having around the world. There are so many different models, uh, but there's also a lot of different kinds of infrastructure that often get conflated here. And so I think it's important to talk through that a little bit. You know, one of the one of the fundamental kinds of infrastructure that connects everybody or the fiber optic cables and the types of you know, backbones that bring, t- that bring the Internet to locations and then the access uh, section of the network. It's really important to have the right model, and there's a lot of really interesting experiments around the world around how to best optimize that with public-private partnerships, whether or not these are state entities. And I think that we should really let these models flourish and develop uh, because there are – uh, we have a, a consultant that just put a paper out on this that I'll be able to share a little bit uh, uh, shortly that, that looks at some of these different models and how different kinds of things can be very effective. Another uh, category of, of local infrastructure that is absolutely critical that I believe Jane has uh, mentioned a little bit is the, uh, the the role of Internet exchange points, the ability to keep traffic local and to create the proper incentives to make sure that the actors in, in the space really do uh, collaborate with each other and, uh, and, and share information uh, and cooperate. Uh, a light regulatory regime is often best for that. Um, but it's a relentless focus on those two aspects that then attracts what the number one thing is that really helps users enjoy the Internet the most, which is having things like caches and servers that can serve the video content. Um, as many have said, uh, this, this has been discussed quite a bit this, this week, you know, there's so much Internet traffic that comes over, for example, YouTube and other sources. It's really important to bring that locally, uh, and that can happen in caches and IXPs, and those infrastructure really do that. Finally, uh, my... my colleague over here from, from Uruguay talked about the experience in Uruguay, which is really absolutely fascinating. Uruguay has uh, the some of the highest penetration of, uh, of Internet use of anywhere in Latin America. It's mostly a state-run model and state-influenced model, and the users are really, really happy. And the um, it doesn't mean that this is the model that should work everywhere. There are, some, there are some unique characteristics in Uruguay that make that effective, but it's the relentless focus that Uruguay has put on these two things, on the, on the cables, making sure the cables are in place, making sure that the, uh, that the IXP infrastructure is in place, that has really benefited everybody else. And uh, it really is acting as a leader for the, uh, for the region in many different ways. So that was uh, Patrick Ryan from Google. You forgot to introduce yourself. I just got past Patrick, but people didn't know who you, um, where you are. Uh, some great I apologize. Thank no, you. no, no problem. Uh, no problem. Uh, you know, great points uh, because it's also in one of the other sessions yesterday talking about the overall infrastructure ecosystem, right? And there's a lot of sometimes focused, you know, false choices. It's, you know, either fiber or wireless, the answer is yes, <laughs> right? Um, it's keeping content locally, which is IXP, Internet Exchange Points, local caching, local content, um, keeping it within regions, within countries. There's a lot of these various pieces that all have to come together to enable right, exactly what you're talking about. So thank you. Um, Thank you very much. I'm Stuart Hamilton. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Uh, And I just wanted to make some comments whilst we're discussing public-private partnerships because it's an area that we are working with in a number of places. Um, There are about 330,000 public libraries worldwide. About 230,000 of those are in developing countries. And during the life of the WISIS process, we've been able to increase almost year on year, the number of uh, public uh, internet access points through libraries. Recently, we've started working um, quite intensely on a number of uh, public-private partnership projects uh, through an initiative called uh, Beyond Access, which you can find at beyondaccess.net. And we've found that uh, this is a very productive way of increasing public access to the internet in the community, particularly as the team's in our pilot countries, which include the Philippines, Peru, and Georgia, 
are made up of representatives from libraries, from the private sector and from government. Uh, and between these sort of three areas, we're able to focus quite intensely on increasing the amount of services that libraries offer, particularly in relation to the Millennium Development Goals areas and also to the WISIS principles. Um, and for those of you who are interested, as I say, I'd encourage you to, to check that out. I wanted to make a very quick observation uh, about the processes we're talking to leading up to post-2015. My organization, IFLA, is concentrating quite intently on uh, trying to get access to information recognized in that framework. And as a result, we've been engaging in the, um, the process going on in New York with the, uh, the Open Working Group on the SDGs. Uh, the kind of parallel process to the WIS is plus 10. Uh, I was there at the General Assembly in September, and I think it was just quite interesting when I mentioned to the large number of NGOs working uh, with development about the WISIS review that was ongoing um, at a meeting of about 50 or 60 NGOs under the Beyond 2015 banner. You could hear the tumbleweed blow through the room. There is no recognition whatsoever amongst the CSO uh, community in the development community that this review is ongoing and that it could at some point meet up with the work that they're taking that they're undergoing in New York. Now I'm not speaking about government uh, in that respect, I'm speaking about the civil society groups but it was, uh, it was quite interesting that, uh, that none of them there recognised that this process was going on. Thank you. Um, unfortunately that's not a surprise um, and going back to one of the earlier comments um, oftentimes what's happening even within this, you know, with those of us who are steeped in this, um, and when we talk to government officials, the government officials in ICT, communications, whatever the labels, they understand and they get it. They also, though, have to, they, they need help and they reach out for help to explain to their colleagues, other ministers, in the cabinet explaining to other parts of their own governments why this is important. So we all share the same experience, which is, you know, we understand, we talk to each other, but we have to broaden out to other sectors of why this is important to them. And it is, right? And it's almost like a mutual help or, you know, society, uh, helping those of us in the conversations to help others in the group so that it expands. And so um, this is a really important point. I think it's something that we should think about um, m mutually supporting one another to spread the word of the importance. Um, Nick Thorne, um, and then is there any, we, we're coming up against the time. We have one back here. I just want to identify any others. We'll do a last round before we move on to the next section. So one, two. Any others? Okay, those, those two? Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Bob, thank you. I just really want, sorry, my name's Nick Thorne. I'm a, uh, a former bureaucrat and a former British ambassador to the UN who was actually marginally involved in drawing up the MDGs while I was in New York and heavily involved in WUSIS in 2005. And I just thought I would reinforce the point made by the last speaker about civil society and, Bob, that which you yourself picked up now, that it is sadly fundamentally true that the two sides of governments, one dealing with ICTs and the WUSIS process, if you like, and the other dealing with the MDGs, do not necessarily communicate. And by adding the word necessarily, I think I'm being overly polite. They do not communicate. Uh, one of the problems of uh, the way in which the or perhaps the unintended consequence of the way in which the Internet is so effectively run by a multi-stakeholder and diversified process is that there is within the UN, within the UN family, no single advocate for the advantages of, of the Internet. I am not suggesting that we should create one, but I do think it should be incumbent upon us to ensure that our own governments and our own elements in civil society work together when we're looking at the review of the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, a sad comment, I, I learned recently from a friend of mine, I, I have not checked this myself, but it is my understanding that from a quick scan of the 
documentation uh, being worked upon for the successors to the MDGs, there are only two references to the Internet. And that, I think, is, is quite extraordinary when, as we've seen today from a couple of excellent presentations, I really like the one from Uruguay, the Internet since the MDGs were created in 2000 has been such a game changer. And I think we should all be working to try and change that. Thank you. Um, that's, a, again, a really important point. I'm sorry that Janos has had to step out because um, the exception that proves the rule is Irina Bakova from UNESCO. Janos is standing in for her a lot. And Hamid and Tori from the IT have come together to create the UN Broadband Commission specifically focusing on how broadband is linked back to the MDGs. And it is, and they are. And, and, uh, but now taking that and everything we've learned over the last three years, which is actually quite successful, and then translating it into so the beyond the MDGs into the SDGs, th there seems to almost be a slip. I mean, it's, it's, there's people really focusing, working, making the case, but then when it, it's, a, it's almost a different audience or group back in New York, and they don't seem to be paying attention to the, the real evidence that the UN Broadband Commission, for example, within the UN structure, has come up with and actually provides the evidence of the benefits of linking the Internet and broadband to the MDGs. I'm quite right. That and the work of the World Bank, yes. neither of them are being taken very seriously in New York. And again, I think I'm being overly polite by using the word very. Thank you. We have one last back over here. And if you could come to, oh, uh, uh, two more. We'll do the one in the back and then we'll come to the table. Um, there's a microphone over here in, on a stand in back of you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry to add another British voice in a, in a row. Um, I'm a current bureaucrat. Uh, my name's Dan Wiles. I work for the um, UK Foreign Office. And I sort of wanted to continue this theme a little bit because I, I think as... Um, uh, someone sort of currently working for a government department on internet governance, we sort of realize the importance of uh, linking development and uh, what we're doing on, on internet governance. We're certainly not yet there yet. It's quite difficult to, to meet across the departments, but we're trying to work closely between the Foreign Office, Department of Culture, Media and Sport, who lead on this for us, and DFID to, to ensure that we're as joined up as we can be. Um, I just wanted to mention that, uh, as Ed Vasey, our minister, said um, at the beginning of the week, uh, we're quite keen to ensure that the WISIS review process bears in mind that the uh, original fundamental goal of WISIS was to bridge the digital divide and to try and ensure that the benefits of the Internet were realized for all. And we, we're sort of finding that um, the Internet governance debate becomes a bit dominated by processes and institutions and how to make them inter interact with, with each other. And maybe we've slightly lost the points that, um, the sort of fundamental points that it's not yet fully delivering for the whole world. And we're really hoping that as part of the WISIS review, we can actually focus in again on how these action lines can really uh, be delivering economic growth and, and social development for all. We've heard some really interesting examples of how that can happen at a sort of practical level today, but we also need to think about at a sort of um, intergovernmental and multi-stakeholder level how we can, can make that a uh, reality in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and the fact that Ed Vizi, from, you know, Minister was here, um, is a visible commitment. Right. There are a number of countries that have senior officials here, and those are the countries that are leading. Um, and what we need to do is not just as the community, but the government leaders from globally who are here from all those countries need to spread the message. And the fact that you know the you know it's it's collaborative with multiple ministries from 
the U.K., as from the U.S., as from Brazil, as from Indonesia and other countries, but we need to have more countries here with that breadth. So thank you. Um, we do have w- one last, um, and then we're going to move on to the next section. Um, and we have actually, I had checked, I thought we had to end at 11, but I was told, no, we have another hour and a half after we finish. So we've gone over a little bit. This has been a great conversation, but w- one last intervention, and then we'll move on to the next section. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Cedric Bahos. I work for UNESCO, and uh, I would like to, to come back to what you just said. I work with Janis Karkens, who is the Assistant Director General, who made the initial presentation. And he briefly uh, showed a chart uh, where he showed all the different six different groups contributing to the post-2015 uh, development agenda process, the Open Working Group on the GA, the High Level Pemin- on Feminine Persons, where we saw also the Indonesian presentation this morning, We have the National Global and Thematic Consultations, the UN Global Compact, Regional Consultations, and the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And it is not quite easy. I mean, of course, some of them are multi-stakeholder setups and some are clearly government-initiated. And because some of the lessons of the MDG uh, review and the the MDG review were that this should be more a bottom-up process, it is a multiple process and also more difficult to get in. And uh, UNESCO is also the UNGIS chair, the United Nations Group on the Information uh, Chair, which brings together 30 30 different UN organizations. And together we made a joint statement on uh, the post-2015 development agenda. So 30 UN agencies coming together and trying to come in into this process and stressing the importance of ICTs for development, including, of course, ITU, including UNDP and others. And even for this, uh, where we would think strong group, it's not easy to bring ICTs up as a topic. Uh, and to to bring it higher up than just a horizontal theme somewhere mentioned somewhere, but making it more of a pillar. So I think um, it is quite obvious that uh, the the governments are really very much on the driving seat, so everyone who who works in governments and and who's connected to governments has actually a a strongly way to, to bring and stress this message. Thank you, Cedric. In fact, that's a great segue into the next section, uh, which uh, you know, uh, Nick Ashton Hart is going to moderate uh, on, on precisely these questions about how to ensure the WISIS's next 10 years better support the sustainable development um, agenda. So, Nick, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, so, um, as Bob has said, that is the question, and we're, we're going to have a slightly different format than you normally see uh, at, at these sessions in that um, the, the, the session facilitators won't be presenting to you. Instead, they will take remote microphones. They're not enough for all five of us. So three of us will be with remote microphones uh, circulating through the crowd to talk to all of you um, while we consider this exact point is, as we've heard the, the, the two processes are not well connected within governments, within civil society, though they are well coordinated within the UN system. And so if, if, we, if we take as a premise that the objective of the WISIS process, as was originally envisaged, is to ensure ICT develop, delivers sustainable development, real benefits for real people, and that post-2015, we want to broaden and deepen multi-stakeholder engagement in WISIS and the follow-up process um, at the national and and local levels, as well as the international level, uh, to realize this this objective, um, but that we don't want the WISIS action lines or the WISIS goals to be completely lost in the sustainable development agenda. We simply want to find a way where the, the work that is done to fulfill WISIS is connected to the broader uh, sustainable development goals as both processes are reviewed in 2015. And so you'll find there's a document, a short one-page document, well, there's two pages, but one page is references if you want to read more, um, attached to this session, which 
um, suggests a few ideas for how these processes could be connected. Um, Cedric is kindly doing a mind map during this segment where the ideas that are proposed will, will all get captured and from time to time we will, uh, in theory, switch to his laptop so you can see the, the, the ideas being mapped. And then at the end we'll have 10 minutes to sort of wrap up and see if the sense of the room is clear on, on one or more points about how to connect uh, the future of the Sustainable Development Goals with the future of WISIS plus 10. Um, I'm, I'm told that we have um, a couple of comments from Felix Dodds about multi-stakeholder elements of the sustainable development process, which we don't yet have in the WISIS process that might get people to thinking. Um, in some ways, we have more multi-stakeholderism here. Well, here, and in some ways, there are some more multi-stakeholder elements that we don't have in, in other parts of sustainable development, which people may not know. Yeah, and, and actually, just a, one, one point on that is that, you know, the Internet Governance Forum, as a multi-stakeholder forum, we, we, we actually can be involved in, and there's a, a role for the IGF, for those of us who are here, in this, this, this conversation. I mean, it, it, it's rather unique to have the breadth of multi-stakeholder players from all of the sectors in one place and to have this conversation. That doesn't always happen. Uh, and so the question is how can we use the IGF and leverage this this week, but more generally including the regional IGFs, into supporting the UN and the WISIS process with the MDG development? Exactly so. And so um, Felix... Uh, I know you, you have some thoughts on this, this subject. Perhaps you might um, mention um, some of the multi-stakeholder elements at the national level that you, that, you, um, that you know of that we might be interested in, you know, the, the Agenda 21 National Action Plans and the like. Uh, but, but be brief because we want to start roaming the room and getting people's thoughts. Felix, it's over. We can hear you, Felix. members of the Sustainable Development Development Working Group. So it's not everybody. And so you can focus on the 70 countries that are members and try and influence them in the take-up issues relating to uh, your agenda. I'm going to very quickly give you an example of what another sector is doing. Um, the, yeah, in the goals, you could say we already know what some of them are going to be. We know there's going to be one on food and nutrition, we know there's going to be one on water, on energy, on jobs, on education, on health. Pretty clear there are going to be goals. Then there are ones where we're not sure. We think gender could be a goal or it could be cross-cutting. Governance could be a goal or it could be cross-cutting. And then we have ones like urban goal, oceans, forests, peace and security, disaster relief, which we don't know yet whether there will be goals. The urban community, what they've done is they've created a platform um, and they, in fact, are organizing a two-day meeting with the UN and with member states through the Friends of uh, Cities group in New York. And they're preparing papers for that meeting. It's on the 5th and 6th of December. Papers on what kind of targets for an urban goal you would have, what kinds of indicators you will have, substantive input, not just asking to be part of the process, but real stuff for governments to take away and think about. 
So I, I would suggest you may think about that as well. It's not that you're going to have a goal, but on these areas that we already know that there are goals, you should be thinking, are there targets or are there indicators under that which you as a group can come together and put forward? Great, thank you, uh, Felix, for, for, for those thought-provoking ideas. So um, at this point we have um, Gordon, uh, Patrick Ryan, and Fareed, who, um, if, if you like, gentlemen, you can, uh, uh, one of you can stay up here and the rest of us can roam or, or vice versa. I've got three microphones here. You just have to turn them on. What's that? Yeah, yeah. So um, a, few, a few possible ideas for how to these processes can be connected. Um, one is that each country could develop a national action plan for how to meet the WISIS goals uh, using the action lines as, their, as the structure of their plans um, so that all these national plans could be then looked at uh, alongside one another and progress assessed. Um, this is an idea that uh, originated with the Rio conference on, on the environment where there, are, there is a national planning process in each country and um, it, the, the question could be how, how can the national action plans for sustainable development be, be coordinated with national action plans for WISIS implementation and the bring, they use that as an opportunity to bring the two communities together. Um, and, and what would be the role of the IGFs in each country and regional IGFs? Uh, is there, a, is there an, is an opportunity there for them to play a role in the follow-up process in assessing progress? Um, and then at the international level, each action line could be mapped to an MDG or SDG, uh, and the international organizations which are currently responsible for each could then coordinate with their counterparts in the, in the SDGs to ensure there's good coordination between them, but also to help governments and other stakeholders understand how they're, how they're trying to, to assess how the, how the implementation is going. Um, and could the CSTD provide a venue for this work internationally, um, as, it's, as it's been uh, a key stakeholder in, the, in reviewing the WISIS process? And could this body, could the IGF, uh, have a role going forward in looking at how the WISIS targets are being met? So with that, uh, hopefully I've, I've asked enough questions to start with. Um, I'm guessing that there will be some thoughts on the subject. Um, you can see Fareed. Wow. You might just check and make sure that the microphones are, are turned on. They were turned off to avoid feedback earlier. Um, I see a gentleman in the front row. If there's no green light, it's not on. If there's a green light and no audio, that's another issue. I think we're set. Uh, I'm Mike Nelson with Microsoft, and I also teach Internet Studies at Georgetown University, and I'm very glad that we're having this discussion. One of the things that's going on with the Internet is that it's spawning some totally new ways of doing business and entirely new economies. In the U.S., there's a lot being written about the sharing economy. We have the caring economy, where volunteers are doing more work and doing lots of things that aren't accounted for in the normal GDP statistics. And it seems to me that one thing that we could do here is promote the collection of more data, not just on how the Internet is rolling out, but also on some of these new economies that are providing real benefit to real people, not just in developed countries, but in developing countries as well. Politicians like to know that their country is doing well when compared to other countries. Uh, when I was in the Clinton administration, there was a lot of discussion about the OECD rankings of, of Internet de development. And after I left, we watched 
as the U.S. went down the ranking tables, and it led to a lot of discussion about why we weren't deploying the Internet as fast as other countries. So I think if we could look at the data problem and see where the collection of information about the economic benefits of the Internet could help inform policy, that would be a very useful thing. And I'd particularly urge us to look at the sharing economy, the caring economy, and the, uh, the app economy, because all of those areas are ones that are not being properly uh, documented and quantified if politicians and publics understood some of the benefits they were receiving because of the Internet, there'd be even more pressure to put in place policies that, that lead to lead, accelerate its development. Thank you very much. Uh, an, an excellent point. Um, I should note, too, that um, Fareed and, 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 and Patrick, uh, feel free, if you have ideas, too, to chime in to, to help spur the, the discussion. Also, if, if the AV people could put Cedric's uh, uh, mapping on one of the screens so uh, we can see it develop. That would be helpful. Hi, Nick. I've, I've got somebody over here that would uh, like to intervene if we have an opportunity. I'm standing over here to your left. Perfect. Ah, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm Garland McCoy with uh, Invinio. It's a not-for-profit that's been working on uh, the challenges of the last mile, if you will, past the uh, urban centers in developing countries that have been uh, uh, working with a lot of uh, the uh, local carriers, with uh, uh, the tech companies, uh, Google, Microsoft, others, Intel, in uh, trying to push out in challenging environments uh, where there's uh, low power um, or intermittent power, uh, but where there's a real, a real desire that's been uh, building uh, out, again, out past the urban centers for uh, reliable, affordable broadband uh, connectivity. And uh, I think one of the things that um, we, you know, want to continue to bring to the forefront are some of the success stories, what's been working out there. One of the things that um, I know was useful for me early on was not so much coming and saying, you know, I'm from America and I've got, you know, here to tell you what to do, but more I'm from America. I started out back in the days when it was called connected computing, and I can tell you, my God, all of the mistakes we made, problems just in this experimentation, the struggle to try to get to where we are now, which isn't perfect, but it's, it's you know, and again, it's a work in progress, but um, providing some of that um, uh, uh, knowledge and uh, the uh, flexibility uh, in the field, and, and so uh, uh, just keep focusing on that in these uh, uh, forums I think would be good as well. You know, got challenges, but also we are, we are making some progress. It's uh, undersea fiber cables come in. We're seeing some, some build out, so it's good. Thanks. So it's, it sounds from two interventions that we have a need of, of capturing what works and capturing it in a way that can be, can be compared uh, like for like in, in different places, in different countries. And then and then, then a way I'm presuming to take those ideas that work and share them, sort of a best practices um, promulgation system. I should note that we have uh, a number of best practices seated behind us here, uh, a number of whom have just won awards from the ISIF for the projects that they're doing. So I'm guessing that they will appreciate that the <laughs> the audience has taken this up without uh, uh, without delay. National plan, and of course, the behavior or the culture of this forum, multi-stakeholders collaboration, it should be also become the spirit of this cooperation in uh, each country. Uh, it means that inviting also all the stakeholders relating and since the beginning I mentioned that this is very important and we should have also the infrastructure, not only the, 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 the uh, let's say, uh, downstream, we should think also for the infrastructure, the upstream. 
Like in Indonesia, we have obligation, what we call the corporate social responsibility. That 3% become the cost for the company. And then for telcos, is beside that, we have the 1.25 1, for USO. So we kindly invite also for the OTT over the top service company, they should have also that kind of, let's say, uh, obligation because they got also the benefit from all the uh, availability of the network. So thank you very much. That's an excellent point. Uh, I just wanted to mention that with still, uh, if the AV people uh, could, could put... Uh, uh, Cedric's laptop on one of the screens, that would be helpful. Um, it, it, it makes me think of a question for you, Gordon. Um, it, when you're looking at the MDGs uh, and, and your plan of action, is, is, the, is the WISIS action line process, is, is, the, is the WISIS targets incorporated into, uh, into your work on the MDGs, or is that a separate process? I'm just, just curious. That was a question to, to you, Gordon. Uh, <clears throat> All right. Um, um, with uh, what we have doing at the MDGs, uh, <clears throat> we try to uh, bring together uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, sectors that should be, uh, we deem that uh, it would be appropriate uh, to involve them to uh, accelerate the MDG achievement. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, ICT, uh, we think that uh, it's, it's very important to be integrated in uh, our job to uh, accelerate the achievement of the MG targets. So um, I think that uh, in the future we need to uh, work out a kind of uh, a framework uh, uh, some more specific framework than what uh, we have already had uh, now, so uh, we can uh, make a, a make strong movement to uh, speed up uh, the achievement of the energy target in Indonesia. We have uh, in our office we have uh, put a, a lot of focus on ICT because uh, I think uh, now it's the uh, best and uh, the most efficient way to reach out to uh, people at all levels. So, uh, but uh, we need to uh, work out a uh, more specific framework to uh, support these ideas. So in the future, we would like to see uh, uh, some kind of collaboration in, in this uh, sector so we can uh, have uh, some kind of specific framework to speed up uh, MDG achievement uh, through by uh, focusing, focusing on the ICT. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, that, that sounds like uh, an open invitation there to, uh, to work with the Indonesian government for Indonesians in the room. Um, do we have some other commenters? Um, I have. Please. I have uh, one point that actually uh, from this uh, mind map is very interesting to me is the <coughs> capturing what works. Um, there's two elements there uh, promote the collection of new data and bringing forward success story. Success story probably more anecdotal, where uh, promote the collection of data is much more scientific. Uh, we see yesterday in the presentation of one of, uh, uh, of my panel, a uh, colleague in, uh, from eBay, showing how the effect of the data, showing the effect of broadband to small medium enterprises, export, and so forth. The, the, the question is that how do we consolidate this data, access it, and make it more meaningful for us to create policy. Is this what, uh, in development world, there's a new approach now that to measure impact people using RCT is more rigorous way of getting into conclusion whether whatever intervention work or not work. Should we introduce this also uh, into, into this? So when we design a policy, um, then we know it's going to be high probability works. It, it, it makes me think that 
maybe there's an opportunity for the economists that are increasingly uh, engaged by both the private sector, have for long been engaged by the public sector and intergovernmental organizations uh, to collaborate perhaps on looking at how data is captured and who has, who has the data and, and can they share it. Um, I don't see a lot of hands raised, but I see Cheryl Langdon Orr looking, looking thoughtful and uh, as I know Cheryl well, uh, I'm sure that she will have trenchant and pithy comments to make on, the, uh, on something here. Uh, thank you, Nick. Cheryl langdon from Australia. I wear a bunch of hats and most people are used to me in this internet governance or internet space uh, making a certain sort of advocacy position, but I want to be really clear. My thoughts in this room are all about how I actually earn my money. Um, and that over the last 30 years has uh, included running small and micro enterprises that uh, are internet dependent but one in particular does procurement for aid funded projects and has been uh, struggling with the concepts that many of you have discussed this morning um, and some of the solutions that I believe are being teased out in, in this current conversation the need to communicate what is best practice, the need to communicate what works and what is a success, the needs to have local initiatives at a national level, but they need to be shared. Because particularly as we're, and I work with a lot of emerging and developing economies, they're looking for examples of what they should do. And until we share not just national initiatives and keep them internally, but have a repository, and this forum at the Internet Governance Forum is, is a good example of what could happen. But I'm wondering about where would my clients find this authoritative list? Where would they find the space to say what should they be doing for their rollout of broadband that would work for them? What examples can they have? Right down to basic procurement of how to get ICT and infrastructure into the mainstream activities that their government departments and public-private uh, partnerships are doing. So I guess what I'd like to see as a thought bubble is all of these think locally, act globally stuff is great, but where do we share it and discuss it and what's the right place? Thanks. So, Cheryl, before you go away, so uh, would being, being, being a person who likes practical and pragmatic answers, uh, strange thing for a person like me is to be as in Geneva perhaps, but um, uh, it, it would a way be to, to do that if, if, we, if we gather, as there seems to be interest in this, if we go. better gather what works, mm -hmm. is a place to look at deciding what works and sharing what works, the national IGFs, and, and the international idea for larger projects. Is that a, is that a possible venue? As far as meetings go, I, I take your point, there must be some place where people can go on the line, I guess, to, to look at what works and how can yeah, they clone I think clone there would it. need to be a continuous ongoing digital repository that we all trust in addition to these, these little then focus points that happen at the national initiatives, the sub-regional and the regional initiatives. But it has to actually get to a top bubble as well. Something has to happen here at IGF because a lot of people like to think they're getting the most highest standard of advice. And so if we just leave it all at national initiatives, it may not be quite as productive. Um, I'm, I'm reminded by that. Um, I, I started in, in international work in the Habitat 2 process for sustainable cities. And uh, if you're interested, there's a, a project called the Best Practices and Local Leadership Program that was started as a part of that, which uh, is it, it's an awards-based system, but it allows anyone to propose a best practice. You submit it in common on a web form, and it's judged by a panel of experts every two years, and the, the recipients receive funding to help them transfer their knowledge to other people around the world who would like to do those projects. So perhaps there's an, uh, uh, there are some vehicles like that. ISIF uh, in our space is, is a great example. Perhaps if we can bring those, prod, those systems of recognition in, then that will provide, a, provide the role you seek and the feedback you seek and give a venue where people like uh, our friends in the back here, oh, I hope will speak up at some point with some ideas uh, could be recognized. Mike? 
Nick. Thank you. I just wanted to, to sort of add on to this um, point about kind of collecting best practices. Um, I took part in um, uh, a session yesterday on trying to uh, look at all of the different various uh, principles on Internet governance and how to more or less sort of try and align that group of principles in, in, into coalesce them around what sort of one list of principles. Um, one of the things that happened at the Seoul Cyberspace Conference last week was the UK presented a next steps paper where we tried to kind of pull together lots of the important work on cyberspace that's happening over the next few months. And what we said there was um, in, in that paper that the, uh, it was very important to try and kind of uh, find more con greater consensus around internet governance principles, but then they, they should lead into uh, model policies. And so this is also part of the, really the kind of capacity building agenda to, to help all regions and nations kind of think about how, how they do this sort of thing and really kind of be able to draw on model policies to put into in practice locally. Uh, one example we gave was the um, uh, Commonwealth Cyberspace Policy Framework. This was launched in Abuja uh, this month um, by the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization Council and the idea of that was that Commonwealth countries could sort of draw from this framework to, to um, put into place local sort of, uh, model policies uh, but, it, but it wasn't just limited to the Commonwealth because the idea was that this framework could also be adapted for, for use in other countries and regions as well so one practical hopefully example for you. So it, it's interesting you should mention that because I, one of the questions I most asked in Geneva of, of country uh, representatives is, how do these countries that have so many Internet businesses do this? What, what kind of policy frameworks can we use? Who can we ask uh, from, from other countries who are successfully leveraging the Internet how they did it? So I guess what you're, you're suggesting is not only should we capture best practices in implementing the WISIS goals and process at a grassroots level, but what enabling frameworks are countries using and why do they work and what are the preconditions to them? I, I know Bob last night was explaining in the U.S. the process they went through of consciously choosing to do things to allow the Internet to develop, and we were saying how, how rarely that's actually heard. So it sounds like you're, you're also advocating that there needs to be a way for governments to share what works in a structured way, perhaps, or captured somehow? Patrick? Uh, Nick, I wanted to just take the opportunity here to make a pitch for a project that's uh, been taking place here on the side. It's really been developed over the course of the past six months, led by uh, Susan Chalmers at, at Internet NZ, called Friends of IGF. A uh, friend has a website at friendsofigf.org that has really just done a fantastic job of collecting a lot of the conversations that have happened here at the IGF over the past few years and getting all of those videos uploaded in one place. That's actually something quite new. There were a few videos that were that were available off and on, but never before had there been a single point of collection where all of this information is available online. And I think this is really important to know because there's an opportunity and also some risk, um, opportunity to really, uh, for many others here to, to join into that process. It's really a very open initiative. Uh, many, if not most, of the participants in it are not members of the multi-stakeholder advisory group. And there's a real opportunity to, uh, to get that going and to continue to invest in it. Uh, most of the investment is in, is in sort of blood, sweat, and tears. It's not necessarily a monetary investment. And the risk is that if there are not others that really look at this, like it, you know, criticize it, but come with you know, constructive suggestions that these types of things uh, risk don't being, uh, not being uh, taken up in, in advance. So I hope, I hope many of you will, will take a look at this and, uh, and take advantage of it. I think that's really important, and video is really important when trying to help reporters understand these issues. But at the end of the day, a lot of policy is driven by one or two bumper stickers and two or three factoids. And I, I kind of worry if we're going to collect all this best practices information, we're going to end up with this huge compendium 
that no one's going to really use, particularly if we just throw everything in there. There needs to be some curation. It's really useful if you have the five best or the ten best examples of how the Internet's being used in agriculture and the five best examples of how the Internet's being used in disaster management so people can look at them quickly. And it's really useful to have those tables that rank different initiatives and, and show who's really succeeding and who's not. And so this isn't, this isn't just a matter of, of having YouTube that just is the collection of everything. It's a matter of having some respected people who can go through and evaluate what's really happening. For the developed countries, the OECD has done that. But we need a much broader effort. We need a way to really work it. I was delighted to meet the new uh, chief economist at the Internet Society, Michael Kenna, who I think is going to help them sort through some of the, n the numbers. But uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done here to, to make sure we're delivering in that one pager the information that the minister really needs. Thank you. Mike, Mike since a lot of these initiatives are starting to come together with all of this information, is, is that, am I hearing uh, that you're volunteering to help, uh, to help pull that information and recommendation set together? I'm one person, but I'm certainly involved in a lot of different work. And, and Microsoft has some incredible analytic tools that will just do it all automatically. So, Martin, I, I think you had a comment. Oh, I very much appreciate that. We're really looking forward to what you're going to do in this area to make this work. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity. It, it may seem facetious, but I mean it. Uh, we don't need to wait for the rest of the world to be ready to have some kind of best practice exchange or award winning thing that everybody is behind. Uh, I think we have some players in the world that at their level all can do these things and very much aimed at what they believe is necessary. And I, I, I do believe Google, Microsoft are amongst those. Uh, .org as such being global uh, steps up there as well. Uh, seeking uh, such opportunities to emphasize best practice and uh, uh, let's make it visible and let's take our responsibility. Um, I, I just should mention that um, part of the process uh, of consultation did produce um, a few questions for this segment uh, which we should keep in mind. Um, uh, amongst those being, uh, how does the development of the Internet's open standards contribute to innovation and economic growth? Um, I think we talked about some of those things and maybe creating some standards and gathering success stories uh, almost from this session. Um, in what ways does the Internet empower people? I'm sure we could make a long list of answers to that question. Uh, how can we encourage investment in physical Internet infrastructure without compromising the global nature of the Internet? Um, it seems to me there's some pretty obvious connections in there with the comments about infrastructure and, and the, the virtuous cycle uh, which infrastructure can play were we to, to reintegrate the, the WSIS goals process in, in the development of the Millennium Development Goals. We would see that infrastructure is a common, a common thing that both require. Um, local content, of course, how can stakeholders cooperate to, to create multilingual content uh, and how can international organizations contribute to building internet infrastructure in, in developing and least developed countries. I know there's an increasing push uh, in the private sector to collaborate uh, on doing that, but it seems to me there's an obvious link there with, with the WSIS goals and the, and the SDGs where um, that there's, an, that there's an obvious use, you know, remote diagnosis in rural areas for health. Um, I was talking to um, the WHO director of the, the maternal health program before I came here, and uh, she was saying that, that they're actually trying to make a priority of how can they use uh, technology to optimize the delivery of health care, especially to remote areas, um, and in particular, um, things like, you know, is there a smartphone app that could be installed on every uh, on every device in a country that would allow people to report births via SMS, via structured SMS, because in many countries, births are simply not recorded. And without that, many other things are not possible. You, how do you vote? How do you register to vote? How do you get a passport, uh, etc.? So 
uh, we were literally talking about, well, you, you know, there's probably an app that could be built for that and then distributed via, via, um, with every new mobile phone. So, um, I, I, I think we should probably start to, to wrap up a little bit. We have half an hour, but, um, it looks like there's some common themes on the standardizing and collection of what works at the level of delivery and at the level of policy formation. Um, there's uh, an argument for action lines at a national level with respect to the WISIS targets, how those relate to the action lines and how, how the international organizations compile information there and, and the MDGs. Um, there's, um, it sounds like some interest in, in the IGF participating in, in these, these projects, the compilation uh, judgment of what works. Um, I'm, I'm trying to read and, and talk at the same time, always a dangerous, a dangerous one. This is really a great tool, I have to say, Cedric. This is a great way to capture the sense of the room. Patrick? Uh, Nick, when I was talking to, uh, whispering with a couple of the audience members back here, there were two or three that pointed out that there are some interesting comments uh, from the remote participants that we should be sure to integrate. And so, just to make sure that we're that we're looking at that. Yeah. Turn to the remote. Yeah. Do, do we do we have any questions over there? The, the remote moderators are behind a cameraman. So if you've been trying to get my attention, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> they're literally yeah, directly they're, through. You said you said you had no. No, we we have nobody at the moment. Okay. Okay, looks like none, none so far. So I, I, I noticed that um, the group behind me is being very quiet. If I may briefly interfere, also one of the recommendations to the IGF from this working group on IGF improvement was that we should try harder to capture a takeaway from a session. Now, this was a very big session, and it's very difficult to find this I have to go closer to the microphone, sorry. I, I recall that one of the recommendations was that we should try harder to produce some takeaways from each session. Now, this was a very rich session, and there's many little takeaways, but I suppose the major takeaways for the IGF would be how they relate to the IGF, and that we should work towards that, and especially, I think, capture good practices seems to be a way where we could work further and also in planning ahead for the next meeting. Should we follow up? Should you make recommendations? Uh, there also yesterday at the session when we discussed similar how to follow up, there was one suggestion you know, that was a discussion on spam and cybercrime that we should maybe organize a two-day, one-day technical event prior to the meeting just to where people can get trained. So these are some thoughts on how we could maybe then take, take it forward and also make recommendations to the planning process for the next meeting. I think perhaps also, uh, Marcus, one of the, from the, the conversation in, in the previous section, uh, there seemed to be um, a building consensus on the importance of uh, uh, messaging to, for involving relate, for each of us, whether it's business, civil society, or government, or the technical community, to reach out to other participants in each of those groups that don't really understand the value and the importance of this process to um, uh, expand the constituencies within each of the multi-stakeholder um, spheres. And I th that was something I was hearing, whether it was from government or civil society or, or business or technical. Um, uh, so I think that is also a recommendation takeaway that was is the sense of the group. Okay, so um, uh, Cedric, do you want to try and uh, – I, I keep looking away and you're, you're capturing madly. Do you want to read through a couple of sort of the, uh, the elements where you could say – that there was a uh, reasonably solid conclusion of something that, that should be done or could be done.
Yes. Um, thank you. It's, of course, not all easy to, to come up and wrap up or, or come already up uh, with some conclusions. But I think uh, one, um, as a... As, as the question is uh, very much on how to link, our, how to strengthen the ICT's uh, presence within the post-2015 uh, process, I think one um, really important message in the beginning is to look at where we stand at the post-2015 process and look also at what are the different topics which are currently known to be in the future SDGs or in the future goals and how to get into the targets and indicators and benchmarks related to them. And we heard about water, energy, jobs, education, health, and, and you yourself had proposed to, to link it somehow to the action line work. And I think uh, there were others where it's not all sure which were mentioned too. But for example, education, we have the action line C7 e-learning where you could try to target and I mean, uh, strengthen and emphasize within the, the, uh, this future goal the importance of ICT. So this is one of an important message to, to look at where we stand for the time being and look how we can get into the existing big chapters uh, of the SDGs. Then uh, I think you're, you're right too. A lot of the discussions uh, went really about let me expand that, um, about the questions of uh, capturing what works. And I think uh, it is, uh, uh, I think there were really two categories, promote the collection of new data and bring forward success stories and good practices. And I think uh, there, there, there have been uh, many ideas and examples mentioned of success stories. And, uh, and how to collect them, the idea. Uh, but it is a question uh, which was raised, which is an important one, uh, how to create authoritative lists, how to gather what works, which is not a long shopping list where no minister will ever look at. And this is an important question, and how to, and uh, Mark is also linked to it in, in saying, how do we take the essentials of the sessions out uh, and can somehow summarize it, even though everything is, of course, captured um, and I think a really important dimension is really also the idea of promoting the collection of new data. Uh, it is a lesson also from the MDGs that they try to really uh, be more concrete uh, and then to be able to measure progress. And we had also one of the interventions saying uh, mo money goes where the goals are, and one could say also money goes where the goals are, the targets are, and the targets are not met. Uh, so it is an important question about the data collection uh, and how to do that in the future. Um, I think for the, as an intermediate summary. Perhaps, perhaps one thing that could be done, given the interest in collecting what works and, 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 and deciding on what is the best practice, is perhaps for the next, next IGF there could be a session on uh, some of the ways in which that has been done related to sustainable development in other areas I, mean, I happen to know the one in Habitat, uh, which does exactly what you're suggesting. Anyone can propose a best practice, but they are then judged, and the, 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 the ones that are the best are easily found and highlighted and searchable across years. Um, and there are also opportunities at conferences related to, to the Habitat agenda where those people are brought to attend and talk about what works, and, and maybe that can be... Uh, the IGF could have a, a part in looking at, 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 how, at, at what is collected, how it could be disseminated, uh, and, and especially in the governance area, where, has, where have people come up with governance ideas um, that really have been very effective at a local level and, and, and even at a national level if there are national action plans? Patrick? This is on, the, on the question of best practices, I wonder if there's any thoughts from the audience about what other groups we might want to look to uh, in order to encourage uh, th this type of activity. Uh, the IGF is one place, uh, but it also depends on the topic, right? I mean, if we're looking at um, the, the aspects of, of bringing more broadband out to, to communities, well, in that case, the International Telecommunication Union provides some good best practices for the infrastructure layer. Uh, you know, perhaps the World Economic Forum or the OECD does a really good job when it comes to the business models associated with that. And certainly the, um, 
uh, you know, maybe the IETF could do a great job when it comes to the technical standards that relate to those types of things. Uh, I'm just throwing some ideas out there. But one of the one of the things that would be good maybe as an outcome here would be to think about what some of those organizations are and to be able to go to them and and let them know that there are some uh, that there's been a discussion here and that there's some uh, an opportunity for them to weigh in on these things. Uh, thank you. I think one of the most important, we realize that uh, ICT Internet is uh, important. It is, uh, right now it's the engine of growth in any uh, sector, be that economic, social, even political. Uh, our colleague from Indonesia mentioned uh, before that uh, the government role in providing these infrastructures is very important. Now, the thing is, many of uh, our leaders uh, has not realized the importance of, uh, of the information, be that infrastructures uh, up to content. Uh, and I suggest that one of the, if we can rec recommend through this IGF uh, meeting, this work group, somehow uh, e-leadership, e-leadership meaning that uh, the the uh, understanding of these leaders uh, about the importance of the information be one of the goal uh, uh, as a tool to achieve uh, all this. Uh, goals and in that case we can put the importance uh, if somehow we can the the after the the MDGs uh, goal uh, the, some, uh, as someone has mentioned that they uh, somehow it doesn't even mention the, the word in, uh, the, the the information the internet in that in that goal if we, we can somehow put that, the information, the, uh, if we have, that information is important to solve all this uh, problem, then that might be a, a, a way, a step forward uh, for us, especially in the develop, uh, developing uh, countries to, to achieve all those goals. Thank you. Um, please. And this one is. Yo creo que no. Digo, hace un momento hablé sobre la importancia del gobierno. Thank you, sir. When, in the specific case of a country like ours, with internet access and the other issues involved, I think you can't say that. Everything is a responsibility of the government, however important the government's part in this is. There are other structures that also have a part to pay alongside the government, things like the regional authorities or uh, sometimes international bodies to assure things like equality of access because sometimes it's an international issue and not just something to do with the individual country, particularly if it's a developing country. There is a limit to the costs that a developing country can bear, or even more if it's a single enterprise. So I think we need to be very precise here, and this is one thing that we should be discussing as we talk about this in the different fora. There is the Montevideo Declaration and so on, which uh, also deserves mention. But there are other texts, too, where we have definitions of Internet governance. It's important, of course, that the Internet itself should be defined. But I think perhaps we should be thinking not in terms of individual governments' vision, but of countries' issues, countries' approach and that would include civil society and other 
elements of the multi-stakeholder community, not just the government itself. That is important if we're to establish the kind of programs that really will get somewhere that will be useful and that will help us to achieve our goals. Thank you. Sorry, I, we're just waiting for the interpretation to finish before the next person started speaking. So, so um, it sounds like that's an argument for a national action planning process that brings all stakeholders together <clears throat> to decide what the objective is because then you can say, here are the resources we have. Here are the resources we need. Here are where the resources are. Maybe they're in the country or, as you say, maybe in the region or, or maybe they're international resources. Um, we've got a comment from, from behind me. Uh, my name is Tarek Zaman. I'm uh, uh, from University of Malaysia, Sarawak. And uh, we are here from ISIF uh, and APNIC. Uh, we are working with the indigenous community of Malaysia, around uh, 25 different indigenous communities throughout the Malaysia. One of the points that has been erased uh, is the participation of the other groups. Uh, I believe that the indigenous communities uh, should be in the debate for the next IGF and on what, or whatever is happening uh, in the coming uh, days or in the coming week. Uh, in, this, uh, in the previous uh, IGF, I have seen that the UNESCO and the other uh, groups really uh, contributed to bring the indigenous people on board uh, in this type of discussions. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, with my experience, I really see that their voice uh, really counts in these all debates. Thank you. An excellent point. We have uh, a comment from over here. Uh, thank you. Mike Jensen from South Africa. Just to follow up on Patrick's suggestion about uh, groups that may be uh, useful to involve in this process, I would like to suggest that uh, the uh, multi-stakeholder group called the Alliance for Affordable Internet, which was established by the World Wide Web Foundation, uh, is an important vehicle there um, because a lot of these best practices and effective uses of the Internet can only happen when the internet is affordable and it's certainly not affordable in many developing countries and they've already set out a fairly clear set of national and regional policies and, and uh, strategies that need to be adopted to achieve a, a more affordable internet and I think it would be useful to involve them in the process. Thank you. An, an excellent notion. It sounds like the, the recommendations there would be an excellent addition uh, to any collection of what works at a policy level, uh, if you have the policy best practices idea. Oh, we have one. Yeah. Uh, perdonen, voy a hablar en español para que se me pueda entender mejor. Um, I too will speak Spanish if I may. My name is Mostal Terra and I'm representing a development organization called IMAC, which is more than 20 years old. We work on using IT in the field and use different kinds of means, for instance, medical uses. There are also things like the use of mobile telephones, not for sending SMSs, but using messaging systems for distant communities so that they can use ICT much in the same way as city dwellers do but this hasn't been done for Uruguay before. As far as the cross-cutting communications are concerned, the Minister, Ministry of Health has its own plan. The other ministries have their own plans, and they never interact. They behave as though they all lived in separate vacuums. And I think what's important is to create the kind of environment which will bring them together and show them that they have to work in concert Otherwise, if they're all working in a totally isolated way, nothing will be achieved. So it's a question of access to as well, but this means capacity building. There is the infrastructure element, that's true, but the people who run it, the people who use it, they also need to be trained. They need their capacity to be built up. Otherwise, nothing will be achieved. We need to integrate everything and to make sure that it functions in an integrated way. If for that, it's very important to have policy 
political plans which will show how all this interacts with the economic sector, the social sector, and so on. And this requires political will. Decisions have to be made. There have to be the politicians. They have to be the people from business. There has to be people from civil society, the social aspect as well. Because it's only if these all work together that we will get somewhere. The important thing is for us to be able to work together and make sure that whatever initiatives are taken are taken collectively by all these different aspects of society. Thank you. Uh, that was an excellent point. I, I understand um, Felix wants to make a brief last comment, and then, and then we'll begin wrapping up. There's only a couple left, I think. And, of course, a final comment from our chair. Felix, go ahead if you can. One thing that I would point out here, you know, we have now four meetings of the Sustainable Development Open Working Group left. Uh, one in November, one in December, one in January, and one in February. So you've got a relatively short window to influence the process. And it seems to me that the one that's most relevant to you is the sixth session from the 9th to the 13th of December, which will deal with means of implementation uh, covering science and technology, knowledge sharing and capacity building, global partnership for achieving sustainable development. And then that's for two days. It's two days in addition on the needs of countries in special situations, African countries, LDC, SID, um, as well as specific challenges in middle income countries. And it seems to me that that offers you a real focus to try and get some of your agenda on to the sustainable development open working group. So I would suggest a coordinated effort by people who have attended this workshop to try and influence that and attend that meeting. Thank you, Felix. That's an excellent, very practical and very specific uh, suggestion. Um, Usman, you're standing at the mic and you have a, a comment uh, briefly. Thanks. Uh, hi, Usman Ahmed with eBay Inc. Um, just another thought on who else to involve in this process. Um, a recommendation would be uh, the trade community at the international trade community level. Uh, the WTO uh, public forum this year was focused on the digital economy. Uh, UNCTAD is doing some very interesting work on um, digital trade. And then the uh, International Trade Center in Geneva also uh, focusing a great deal on how the Internet is impacting uh, traditional industries. And so I think they could be helpful not only from a uh, data perspective, they have a lot of data on the impact of the Internet, but also uh, if we're going to be working on best practices here, uh, they're also focused on creating their own set of best practices. And so you don't want to have a disagreement between uh, these groups. And so probably tying them in early on might be really helpful. Thanks. Well, and, and in that vein, since I do a lot of work with the trade community, there is a trade and development committee at the WTO, and it seems like uh, perhaps some of our government friends could usefully suggest that that committee look at how trade impacts development, delivery of the MDGs, and, and the technological dimension, um, because I suspect the agenda of that committee is candidly not terribly... Uh, exciting, shall we say, at the moment. And, and I think there would be a lot of, that, that would be a welcome comment to, to bring the trade community into that discussion. Um, but I'm cognizant of the time. Uh, with seven minutes to go, uh, Mr. Chairman, perhaps you, you have any? Or oh, Stuart, do you want to go briefly, quick? Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. Just to let you know that IFLA has spent the last uh, couple of months taking a very close look at how the WISIS process and the, uh, the MDGs process might link up. And in relation to Felix's comments, IFLA will be trying to organize a side event at that means of implementation meeting on the 9th of December in New York um, on the theme of access to information in relation to development. And if anyone is interested, if we want, you know, the idea is it's not just IFLA, it's a coalition of groups that would be interested in uh, bringing that theme more into the discussions of the open working group. So that could really provide an opening for getting some of our issues on the agenda. So you can see me afterwards if that's uh, something of interest to you. Excellent. Thank you. Stuart. And, and 
Stuart, and I would suggest take the message from this discussion to New York. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the last word is yours. Thank you, Nick. Um, I believe that we had a very productive and fruitful uh, session, and I hope that the many takeaways that we produced today can be uh, followed followed up. And I thank uh, our moderators and our uh, participants for the valuable uh, discussion and contribution in this uh, session. And the session is now uh, closed. And please join us this afternoon in, uh, in this main hall for the fo focused discussion on human rights, freedom of expression, and free flow of information on the Internet. Thank you.